Guys, good evening. It's good, it's good. All right, guys, what you'll notice is that I, I really don't like quiet rooms when I speak. And maybe you notice this even in moment if you've been here before, if you've like seen me MC or like, I just don't, I don't vibe with the whole like, we just spectate and listen. So like, whether you're a Pentecostal of Pentecostals and you're like, hallelujah, like, or if you're just like, mm, yes, yes, yes. Like, give, yeah, mm, thank you, Nick. That's good, Nick. Say, that's good, Nick. That's good, Nick. It's an inside joke. Don't worry. Um, so please, give me, some, give me some talk back while I'm speaking, all right? Guys, I'm so excited for tonight. Um, it's such a joy and a privilege to be a part of this community. If you haven't been a part of Thursday night gatherings before in the past, uh, welcome. Uh, you're welcome to join us any Thursday. Uh, but like, it's so fun to be a part of this community and be a part of what God is doing in our midst here at YWAM Harpenden. Um, like, as you can tell, like, Dang, it just seems like God's doing so much, and it's such a wonderful community to be a part of, of, of people locking arms and just running after Jesus. Amen? Amen. In these last few weeks, um, ever since the end of September when we've started our new sort of training quarter, uh, we've been spending these Thursday nights looking at some of the cultures uh, of the kingdom of God and being a kingdom community, especially a kingdom community that's set apart for mission. And we've been looking at what are some of the, the sort of like key cultures that are needed for a community. So we've looked at uh, a handful over the last like six weeks, I believe, and we've looked at welcoming the disruptions of God in our midst. We started off the quarter looking at that, and it was so powerful, and I feel like it teed us up for like every one of these Thursdays being just like almost a scheduled disruption, you know? We're like, we're all coming into the chapel, and we're like, I'm ready for a disruption of God in my life. And is it really a disruption if I'm expecting the disruption? Who knows? But I'm ready for the disruption of God. And like these next couple hours, I want to get with God and I want him to disrupt my life, which has been so good. The next week we looked at kingdom hospitality, the power of the table, welcoming in one another, hosting each other, hosting Jesus. We looked at fostering the apostolic and the prophetic in our midst, which those are both really big words, but we had some wonderful people break it down. How do we as a community foster movement like we see in the book of Acts and in the Bible? How do we become a community of people that are seeing God move in our midst, that we're taking new ground, that we're seeing new things, and how are we partnering that with what God is speaking to us as individuals and as a community? It was so good. Say so good. I was, in, uh, I was in Germany when Lynn brought his uh, message on, on the apostolic, and I was tuning in via the live stream. What up, everyone, on the live stream? You're welcome. It's so good. And then last week, go God. <laughs> go God. We had the wonderful Dan Bauman speaking on the unoffendable heart and how in the, in the kingdom of God, there is no room to take offense. And... Uh, I don't know who has like more authority to, to talk about like being unoffendable than somebody who is imprisoned in Iran and uh, you know asked the person who is beating him every day to like be his friend. I think like that's just a that's just a <laughs> radical story. Um, but what he deposited last week was just so good. Again, I was in Amsterdam, so I was joining on the live stream. What up? The glory's on the live stream. And, and his story of like hiddenness and forgiveness and healing was so powerful. And, and the phrase that stuck out to me as he um, sort of spoke to us last week was trust and obey. Trust and obey. He wants to free us to walk with him being enough. And that's like at the, at the core of having an unoffendable heart is trusting and obeying God and us walking free of everything with Jesus being enough. And like, honestly, I feel like that is, you could summarize every single thing that you think might be a culture of the kingdom of God with that. God wants to free you to walk with him being enough in your life. Like, guys, we could ponder and meditate on that phrase for the next, the rest of this quarter. Just like if somebody just got up here and was like, man, God wants to free you to walk with him being enough in your life. And then we could just go back into worship. Like, that would be a great Thursday night gathering. Because, like, man, it's so real. God just wants to free us. Like, he wants to free us from offense. 
He wants to free us from selfishness. He wants to free us from our schedules. Like he wants to free us even tonight from being like quiet and timid and like contained. Like he wants to free us to be a celebratory people, to be an unoffendable people, to be a disruptive, hospitable people. He wants to free us walking with him. And guess what? Him being enough is going to be that, the way that we get to looking more like him in that way. Like when he is enough in our life, then like these things that are of him, they will just happen to, 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 to be in our life. Praise God. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want anything in my life that is unbiblical. Like I think we can so often read the Bible and, and just begin to sort of, I'm going to make up a verb right now, where we begin to theologize it. All right? We like read the Bible and we're like, all right, cool. Like, what's a principle about this? Or what's a theory? Or like, how do I, you know, like write a sermon on this? And we begin to sort of like conceptualize it and put it into sort of theological boxes rather than just being like, all right, what does that look like in my life? And I want everything in my life to be reflected in Scripture. And not like judges. You know, I don't want my life to reflect judges. Not that kind of scripture, you know, where everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. I don't want none of that. I want, like, my life to reflect, like, the Jesus way. I want my life to reflect the Jesus way. I want my life to reflect the way that he commissioned his people out. I want my life to, to reflect the way that he walked and what he embodied. And, and I don't know, like, sometimes we're going to be talking about celebration tonight. Whoop, whoop. Like... Sometimes we can think of like spiritual things, godly things, Christian things, and like celebration is like over here. And it's not that we're like, oh, that's ungodly. We just don't really consider it to be one of those godly Christian things. And, and when you think of celebration, you might think hooping, hollering, rah, 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 excitement, which we might talk about a little bit. But, but like celebration is rooted in surrender to Jesus and obedience to the scriptures. Like, that is what true kingdom celebration is all about. It's, it's surrender to Jesus and obedience to the scriptures. So I'm excited. We're going to talk about it. Praise God. All right. Raise your hand if you are from the global south. The global south, as in, like, the southern hemisphere, primarily Africa and South America. Raise your hand if you are from Africa or South America. That's good. I think these are the kind of people that we typically think about when we think about celebration. Am I right? Like, man, if you've ever been to South America, man, everything's a party. It's like you're going out for dinner, and, and like you go to, I was in Brazil, and you go out for some churrasco, and, uh, and, and like the people bringing the meat, like they're just stoked you're there. You're stoked you're there. There's like endless supplies of really delicious meat. Like it's hard not to be excited when you're there. Or, or if, you've, if you've ever gone to Africa, I was in Kenya for a, a month a few years ago. And man, it was like we went to church and it was, first of all, it lasted for quite a few hours. And, and second of all, the entire thing was just fun. Like, I've never been so sweaty leaving a church building because I just, you can't s sit still. Like, there's something about these cultures which have caught a glimpse of the culture of celebration that's found in Scripture and have just, like, you know, they've just embodied it. They're like, yeah, we're going after it. And, of course, like, there's no culture on earth that is perfect. But, but these cultures, man, they've, they've embraced this sort of dancing, the singing, the partying, the smiling. Like, and it's so at the heart of the kingdom of God. And then, I don't know, if we're in Europe, right? Yeah, that's good. I don't, I don't know if, like, that sort of thing is what we would typically associate with with England specifically. I don't know. It's like you aren't really thinking about like people in a church building dancing, like that sort of like, yeah, like I'm just pumped for Jesus, like, or like, I don't know, that, that sort of vibrant expression. That was not what I typically associated with, with England or with Europe as a whole, even like in North America. It's like a bit more contained. It's a bit more, you know, you go through the motions. It's a bit more, dare I say, consumeristic. You just kind of, you can come in and out. You don't really need to be seen. Like you can participate if you want to, but we're seeker friendly, you know. Um, but I just think that there's something in the heart of Europeans and Brits specifically, that just needs to be unlocked. Like, 
the, if you're a European in this room, watch out. Like, I'm coming after you tonight. Like, there's going to be something unleashed. Because raise your hand if you've ever been to a football match. Mm. Yeah, raise your hand if you've ever been in a pub during a football match. I'll tell you what, the culture, the, the not-so-kingdom culture of celebration is very present in those places. And it's not like limited to just people from the global south. It's not limited to people from a certain culture. I mean, if, if it's your team or if it's not your team, you're experiencing it. Like, and they're like, oy, 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 oy. you know, they could like never talk to a stranger in the pub. Like they wouldn't dare like break the ice, talk to someone. But then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I love you, bro. You're going to be the best man at my wedding. Like just because like their favorite footballer like scored a goal. And if I'm being honest, I think it's a bit of a tragedy that people get more excited about sports than Jesus. Yeah. Like, I think it's, it's a bit of a tragedy that a club is a more comfortable place to dance than the church. Yeah. I think it's a bit of a tragedy that a pub is a more comfortable place for people to laugh very loudly than a church. Like, why are people afraid to dance and to clap and, and, to, and to laugh in a church building? Like, man, the very spirit of God is in his people. The spirit which brings love and joy and peace. Like that spirit is within us. Why are we not like just so pumped about it? Why are we so timid about it? Why are we so contained about it? And, and we talk about this maybe when it comes to mission. Like, oh, you've got the cure to cancer. Like you would be selfish if you didn't go out and give that cure to people. But like there is the hope of glory within you. There is the hope of glory within you, and it's not, just, like, it, it's not just for evangelism, but it's like to release God's kingdom in all of its fullness, not just its message, but its culture everywhere you go. Like there should be joy wherever the people of God are. There should be gratitude wherever the people of God are. There should be celebrations wherever the people of God are. And my heart tonight is simple. I want to give permission for you to walk in wild celebration and unapologetic joy. Like that is my goal tonight is that we would be released from this place being like, man, Connor handed me a permission slip that I can walk in wild celebration and unapologetic joy that's rooted in trust and surrender to Jesus. And the foundation for all of this, at least in my life and my perspective, is found in Philippians chapter 4. So if you've got a Bible, if you've got a phone, feel free to go there. We're going to read Philippians chapter 4, starting in verses 4 and 5, and then we're jumping to 8 and 9. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> There's something about context which I just think makes this scripture jump. This is one of, one of Paul's prison letters. So Paul's writing from prison, and he's saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And Paul's had some moments where he has literally rejoiced, and he has been set free from prison. His letter to the Philippians is not that moment. He's experienced the freedom of God in the midst of his worship, like Nathan was talking about, but this isn't that moment. What does Paul do? He's like, oh, man, I didn't get free this time. I'm not going to keep looking to Jesus. I didn't get free this time. I, I'll mope about it. Like, I didn't get free this time. Like, that's, that's not his response. He's sitting in prison writing to a church that he planted. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. What a weird thing to say when you're sitting in prison rejoicing. Yeah. Hey, look, make sure everyone knows how reasonable you are. It's because it's reasonable to celebrate when you have the hope of glory within you. Oh, my goodness. The Lord is at hand. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Like, what? Imagine sitting in a prison cell, being like, man, I just can't get my mind off of how good life is. Like, I'm so blessed. You know, like, and he's calling this reasonable. If we were, like, 
sitting in a prison cell with Paul. We're like born again, spirit-filled believers sitting in a prison cell with Paul. And he's saying this sort of stuff. I'm like, dude, bro, you're so naive. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying you're naive. I'm like, uh, I, don't, I don't know about this one, Paul. Like, you're being kind of unreasonable. I know you've got this sort of like, I don't know, this sort of aptitude towards positivity. It's on your number one strength finder. Like, or, you know, you're a generally optimistic guy. Maybe we'll get out of this at some point. But you're kind of being unreasonable. But Paul's like, no, 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 no. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice because the Lord is at hand. And then he starts listing off all these things, whatever is good, whatever is just, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any of this stuff, which I think in Paul's mind he's kind of implying that there is, he's like, think about these things, you know? And then as you practice these things, the God of peace, what do you need in a prison? Probably the God of peace. You probably need some peace in your life. You're probably uncertain about what's going on. He will be with you. And man, what's Paul saying that if he, like, he must have been like the master of practicing these things. If he's got the audacity to write this from a prison cell and say what you've received, heard, and seen in me, do it. Like, and I think we sometimes think about Paul as a pretty serious guy. If you've ever read the book of 1 Corinthians, you're like, mm, mm, bit of a joy kill that, Paul. There's a lot of rebukes in this one. <laughs> I prefer Ephesians. Uh, but like, Man, Paul must have just been the most celebratory guy. Imagine every situation the Apostle Paul, the early church father, is going into. Like, I don't know about you. If I was about to have a conversation with Paul, I'd be nervous. I'd be like, dude's about to critique my whole ministry. Like, and he's about to tell me, uh, like, everything I'm doing wrong. He's going to be like, why aren't your handkerchiefs healing people? Like, that's what I'm thinking is about to happen when I'm about to talk to the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul is going into every moment, every conversation, thinking like, hmm, what's true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent about this situation? Like, what a paradigm shift. Like, that is the perspective that Paul is going into. All right, guys, I'm still in my intro, so I just need to, like, <laughs> fast forward a little bit. But, like, we're going to cut some stuff out tonight. Uh, <laughs> but celebration, guys, is not about conforming to the culture of a certain ministry. It's not about conforming to the culture of a certain community or nation or personality preference. But Celebration is about entering into the kingdom of God and into the lordship of Jesus Christ and trusting that what God says is actually true. Like what God says is actually true. Like and, and looking for that thing, like looking for that thing in every situation. Like Paul's encouraging us, find that which is good and true. Find that which aligns with what God has said about a person about a situation, even if it's hard, what has he told him? I mean, Lynn talked about this a couple weeks ago if you were here. Like, the first prophetic word that the Apostle Paul ever got, which, you know, was given to him once his, his eyes were opened and he was able to become an apostle of Jesus, was all about how much he was going to suffer for Christ's sake. That's a terrible prophetic word. I don't want that prophetic word. But, but Paul's like, Praise God, I'm going to take that on. I know the truth now. And he's got that in the backdrop for his whole ministry. He's like, all right, so he's in the prison. And he's like, praise God, I'm in obedience to what God has said to me. Like, I'm right in the will of God. And I'm going to look for what's good about this. He's not like, oh, man, why did I end up in prison? Oh, I'll go read my journal. Oh, wait, yeah, God did maybe say that I would end up in prison. That kind of cheers me up a bit. Like, no, he's like, I am right where God wants me to be. How do I use this for the kingdom advantage? And in the first like chapter of Philippians, he's talking about how the gospel has served like to advance the kingdom all throughout. All the prison guards are getting saved. Like, like this is what happens when the culture of celebration rooted in surrender is at work in the Apostle Paul's life. He's in prison, he's writing letters. And people are getting saved in the midst of prison. And, and like, I just want to say, like, this isn't just a one-off with Paul. Paul wasn't like this unreasonable kind of guy. I'm going to throw some scripture at you, all right? Say scripture. scripture. And in staff meeting today, for those who are part of why I'm harping in staff, we looked at some of them, but I'm just going to blitz through a bunch from Old Testament and New Testament about celebration, thanksgiving, joy. 
Isaiah 52, 9, break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. Psalm 98, verse 4, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth, make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. We just read it, Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I say rejoice. Everyone say rejoice. Psalm 126, verse 2. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. And then they said among the nations, the Lord's done great things for them. Ooh. You think it's just Old Testament. We got First Testament. First Thessalonians, uh, New Testament, sorry. First Thessalonians chapter 5. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. What? This is the will of God that you'd give thanks in everything? That was wild. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant. Oh, how good and pleasant it is for people to dwell together in unity. 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Let us celebrate the festival of the Lord, not with the old bread of malice and evil, but with the unleavened new bread of sincerity and truth. Let us celebrate with sincerity and truth. Oh, Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 15 when the father comes out to find his lost son return. He says, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat. And celebrate, for my son was dead and now is alive. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Hallelujah. Guys, it's all throughout Scripture. Jesus talks about it. That He's spoken these things that are... It's not just so that we can like have good Instagram stories. Like celebration isn't just so that we can like, I don't know, be an excitable and and, and attractive people. Although it does do those things. When we are a celebratory people, the outside world is looking in thinking like, "I, I want what they have. But that's not necessarily the purpose of celebration. Celebration unlocks things within us. I remember being a a 15 year old in South Florida. And I didn't grow up in church, and, uh, and I didn't really, like, go to church every week, and I didn't know much about Scripture. I didn't know much about who I was. Um, and, and when I was, like, in my teenage years, I kind of, like, if I had any sort of Christian background, I I'd kind of altogether walked away from it. Not really aggressively. I wasn't, like, anti-Christ, but I, I was just indifferent, you know? I was just, I wasn't the anti-Christ, that is for sure, <laughs> but I wasn't anti-Christ, and I was just indifferent, you know? I was just like, I was just like, uh, like, I don't know. I hadn't seen the gospel transform anyone's life. Like, why would I follow those rules then, you know? There's no power in it. So I was just indifferent to it. 
And, and I found myself at 15 years old, I was smoking, I was drinking, I was doing all that stuff, and I was just depressed. I was just depressed. And, and the people I was hanging out with, man, I was just the butt of all of their jokes. That was my community. Like, I did some really stupid stuff to get a laugh out of my friends. Like, I have scars on my body from the stupid things that I did to get a laugh out of my friends. Like, not worth it, guys. And, and my friends in high school, they used me. But, but I remember when I was 15 years old, I was sitting on my couch one evening, depressed, eating Ben and Jerry's. And that's not an anecdote. I was literally eating Ben and Jerry's. And I was watching Jimmy Fallon, and I got a call from a buddy of mine who was like, hey, do you want to come, like, skateboard in a parking garage? And I was like, yeah, sure, cool, yeah, that sounds great. And he was, like, the only sort of, like, real Christian person that I knew. And I started hanging out with him and three of his friends from church. And that weekend, I spent the next 72 hours with them. I didn't go home. My mom was concerned. And I spent... The next 72 hours with these guys being the most celebrated, encouraged, uplifted individual that I had ever met. Like, where my high school friends were just using me as the butt of their jokes, these guys were like, man, our job, I think over the next 72 weeks, they had like a little conference. They were like, I think our, our job over the next 72 hours, sorry, not weeks. It did, it did go, it was quite a long time. They didn't stop. But they were like, our job over the next 72 hours, that's just like blow up Connor with encouragement. Let's just make him feel like he's the coolest 15-year-old there is. And all these guys, they were like 19 and 20. They were like older brother figures. I was intimidated. They all had facial hair. And, <laughs> and they, were, they were like, let's make this guy feel like he is the cat's pajamas. Like he's the coolest guy around. And I, I'll tell you what, I got home on Sunday night. My mom, first question she asked was, where have you been? Uh, and, then, and then she was like, how was your weekend? And I was just beaming. I was like, Mom, this was so great. And there was like an addiction that came about. Like I was like, I want to hang out with these guys. Like there was no like hard feelings towards my other friends, but there just wasn't even a thought in my mind of like, do I still want to hang out with these clowns? Like I just want to hang out with these guys because they are, are, are making me feel so celebrated and loved. And, and it unlocked something within me. Like it was attractive to hang out with them, but gosh, I just wanted what they had. I was like, where is this coming from? What is the source of this? And I was just going after the source. A few years later, after I'd been following Jesus, I, I ended up on this like week-long missions trip after I graduated high school. And I was in this random part of, of South Florida called Bell Glade, and we were doing some like, like work throughout Bell Glade, and it was like this big church camp. And all of these uh, people that were on my team, they had all just graduated high school. It was our last year to do it. It was the most fun uh, week of the summer, so we were all there. And we were all talking, and they were like, oh, where are you guys all oh, going after this? Everyone, oh, I'm going to the University of Florida. Yeah, I'm going to Florida State. Yeah, oh, I'm going out of state, actually, you know? I got a scholarship for engineering. You know, like, all these, oh, yeah, that's so cool. Are you excited? And then they would turn to me, and they'd be, oh, Connor, what are you doing after Bell Glade Student Week? And I was like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't apply to any universities. I work at Chick-fil-A. Um, and if you know what Chick-fil-A is, it's like KFC. And... Uh, but like, but like with godly principles, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's like better than, I'm just trying to contextualize it, guys. I, I don't want this to be the majority of my speech, you know, like I don't, I don't got time. I'm, it's 8.30 already. I can't differentiate what, what, what Chick-fil-A is. But I'm like, I work at Chick-fil-A. I'm not going to university. And, and they're like, oh, yeah, that's good for you. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's cool. Uh, do you like that? I'm like, mm, no, it's all right. And they're like, well, what, what do you want to do in life? I'm like, I don't really know what I want to do. Um, I was like, but, you know, I did have a friend. He mentioned this thing called DTS. And, uh, and I was like, and, and DTS, it's kind of like what we've been doing this week. You know, it's like a lot of worship. It's a lot of prayer. You know, we get some teaching. Like, oh, man, the, the Christian friends there, they're great. We're serving people, but then actually like we go out and we, we go to a different nation and we serve people. And all of my friends, man, they looked me dead in the eye and they're like, Connor, this has you written all over it. Like, man, everything we've seen this week, we love you, but you should not be working at the Chick-fil-A drive through Like you should be because you embody all of their principles. You're so happy and you say my pleasure. Like nine years later, guys, I'm still saying it. It's embedded into who I am. But, but they're like... You shouldn't just be working in a drive-thru at a fast food restaurant. Like, 
This is what you were made for. Like we've seen you talk with people. It's amazing. You, you go and you connect with people. You're, you're so encouraging. Like you're excited to go out and do this stuff, which all of us are kind of a bit like, uh, about. They're like, man, this is who you are. And these people, they began to celebrate the gifts and, and the calling and, and, and the talents and the things that God has put on my life. And all of a sudden I was like, yeah, yeah, maybe I should do this. I was like, why not sell my car and move to Hawaii? Yeah, that's great. Like, you know, I was like, I was 18 years old. I was never going to do that. I lived, I had a mattress on my friend's floor. Like that is where I was at. And my friends celebrated what they saw within me and it unlocked something within me. Guys, and that is what the kingdom of God and what celebration in the kingdom of God is all about. It's, it's more about seeking out the good and calling it forth in circumstances, friendships, yourself, than it is about being loud or charismatic. Like, the culture of celebration and how it's expressed with all of, like, jumping around and all that stuff, it's amazing. But that is the fruit of a kingdom culture. That is not the kingdom culture itself. Right? Like, and we cannot elevate the fruit above the actual, like, substance of it. So what I don't want is us walking away from this. Hey, shut that up. And what I don't want is us walking away from here being like, yeah, I come to church, I come to church, and I'm really loud, and I'm really charismatic, and I'm really this, and I'm really that. Like, we really worship times. Like, no. Like, I do. Like, that's great. Like, it's super fun. But, but like, that is just a fruit of what, like, the godly, like, culture of celebration cultivated in our midst will produce. When we are looking for the good, Jesus primarily, in, in circumstances, friendships, yourself, in moments, when we are focusing on the good, whatever is just, lovely, pleasing, so on and so forth, and we are calling that forth and drawing that to the forefront of our mind, that is what kingdom celebration is all about. My friend Joe Butler put it so good this week. He said, let what's good take center stage. Oh, yeah, just a round of applause to Joe for that. Like, let, that's just what Joe's like. He says great things all the time. He says, let what's good take center stage. And when we lay down our, our culture, our preferences based on personality, or, or even our sense of obligation to celebrate a certain way, and we take up this sort of exciting, faith-filled, heavenly perspective celebration that the Bible describes in Jesus embodies, transformation will occur. Like it occurred in my life, and, and I've seen it in, in so many lives, in so many circumstances. Like people are set free from demonic lies about their identity when we celebrate who God created them to be. Like when we, when we grab heaven's perspective, and I'm like, Violet, you're walking in a certain way. It might sound like a rebuke. It's not a rebuke. Like, Violet, you aren't living up to what God has, has called you to be like. You are this. You are this. You are this. You're an anointed worship leader. You are someone who spiritually forms people. Like you are spiritually formed yourself. You have a deep well with Jesus. Like when we begin to take hold of these things in our friend's life, like people are set free from demonic lies about who they are. Like, how good is that? When we cultivate a culture of celebration, callings and giftings of all sorts are championed because people don't feel like they need to fit into a certain mold. They're like, oh, I don't need to be the preacher in order to be championed. I don't need to be the, the anointed worship leader to be celebrated. Like, I can sit in my office and obey God by responding to my emails in a timely fashion, hallelujah, and, and, and like people who are called to do the things that maybe none of us want to do or have the gifting to do, those people are championed and celebrated because we have celebrated their gifts and their callings, right? How good is that? Confidence is released within a community, right? Confidence is released within a community that has embodied and embraced the culture of celebration that's found in the kingdom of God. Confidence. Because you aren't afraid of failure, and you aren't afraid of being judged. You're like, man, these people care about me and they want to celebrate the good and the God in me. Like they want to celebrate what God is doing in my life. These sorts of things are released. Risks are taken. Kingdom ground gets covered and new initiatives come into being when we embrace this kingdom celebration. Praise God. And I'm about to skip so much of my notes because it is time to land. <laughs> and... 
We are going to, <laughs> praise God, I'll talk next week as well, I guess, I don't know. Well, I'm not going to do that. This is a joke. It's all right. Um, <laughs> so you guys, get, you're like, oh, gosh, <laughs> praise God. Well, I just want to go to cereal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, like, who's up for embracing this kind of kingdom culture of celebration? And, like, I just want to encourage us, like, as a community, as we embrace this and we're like, man, I want to get God's, like, perspective on people and places and things and other nouns, like, I want to like get God's perspective and call that forth and fix my eyes on whatever is true and lovely and just and pure and excellent. And I want to rejoice in the Lord always. I want what's good to have center stage in my life. Like I want to like dare us to see how that will transform our community. How will that transform like our individual lives? Like the people in our lives just being set free from having to be or act a certain way because they're celebrated for the God-given gifts, but also the sort of encouragement. No, that's, you're acting this way. That's not how God's made you. Like, I want to celebrate how God's made you, not this little rubbish thing that you're doing right now. But like, as I was praying for tonight, I felt like there was four inhibitors. Mm, big word. Say inhibitors. inhibitors. It basically means four things that will hinder you from stepping into celebration. The first one, everyone say comparison. comparison. Mm. Everyone say comparison one more time because I have to drink water. Comparison. Mm. Mm. No, did anybody say the full thing? No, it's all right. All right, comparison. Comparison is an inhibitor to celebration. Because you're comparing yourself with someone else. Oh, that's not my culture. That's not my personality. That's not my preference. Does anybody, my, my best friend Dylan Riley Gober was on staff here. Give a shout out to Dylan Riley Gober. He's, he's serving God in the nations of Southeast Asia right now. Praise God. And he is the most celebratory individual that I know. If, if we were, and Dylan was still on staff here, there's no way that I'd be speaking. Dylan would be speaking. Because he's the celebratory individual I know. But if I was bound up in comparison, I would be thinking, oh, Dylan's got the whole celebration at why I'm Harpenden thing covered. I don't have to do that. I'm comparing my, myself to him. That's more of his personality. That's more of his preference. I don't have to cover that. But that's, just say rubbish. 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 Like, that's rubbish. Like, we don't compare ourselves to that. Like, we don't compare ourselves to others because that, in, that inhibits celebration in our midst. We don't all have to celebrate the same, but some of the same things should be present in our celebration. Does that make sense? Like, we don't all have to celebrate the same, but some of the same things should be present in all of our celebration. Mmm, that was deep and wise. All right, the first one, comparison. And the second one, say criticism. criticism. Criticism, whoa. Does anyone, you don't have to show your hands, but does anyone have the tendency to be critical when something good happens? Mm. You're like, whoa, we're in a powerful worship time. No, everyone's like laying out on the front like they were about 38 minutes ago. And, and someone's just like, mm, it's probably hype. Mm. I bet if those cool lights weren't on, they wouldn't be on the ground. You know, they, you just start to become overly critical of all the things that are happening. And the first response is, a, is to critique rather than to celebrate. Like, imagine in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son comes home and the father's like, why are, why are you covered in poop? Like, why are you covered in pig poop? Nah, uh, nah. Like, what if that is his, like, that's a critique. But no, his first response is a celebration that his son is home in their midst. And, oh, man, and criticism will be the downfall of our celebration if we let it. Oh, so the inhibitors to celebration are comparison. Say comparison. comparison. Criticism. Say criticism. criticism. Callousness callousness. So a callous is something which forms after years and years of use. So raise your hand if you play the guitar. You probably have calluses on your fingers, right? If you're a, if you're a, a worker in a trade or an athlete, you might have calluses on your hands because it's something which forms after years and years of use. And it's something that kind of like makes that part of the body less tender. And, and it's not necessarily like this, this, attitude of callousness that I'm talking about, it, like apply it to your heart. Like after years, you know, it's, it maybe says stuff like this, like, mm, I remember when I used to dance like that. 
I remember when I used to celebrate people like that. I remember when I used to, you know, like just give compliments out willy-nilly. Like I remember when I was so excited about someone being saved, but I've been in YWAM for 20 years now. So many people have gotten saved, you know? That's what callousness looks like. And it's, uh, 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 sorry, it's just gross. It's gross, right? Just say gross. gross. We don't want callousness in our midst. It's not anti-celebratory. It's just indifferent to celebratory, which sometimes is even worse. You're like, it's in you. Just, get, just, just don't take yourself too seriously, you know? So criticism. criticism. That's good. <laughs> Comparison. Comparison. Callousness. Callousness. And the last one is competition. competition. We love when God speaks with things that all start with the same letter, right? so good. And like an inhibitor to celebration will be competition in our midst. The poverty mindset that says there's not enough to go around. The, it's, it's me versus Emmanuel. You know, like we're fishing from the same pond and there's only so many fish. Like if he's succeeding, then I'm failing. I'm falling behind. I'm losing. And like this isn't something that I think any of us are actively like thinking like, oh yeah, I'm against that person. But it can so easily creep in in our ministries and in our communities and our churches. Like, I just don't think that God's worried about all the people getting saved. Like, and that there's not gonna be enough people for you to go out and do evangelism to see someone get saved. You know, like that's not God's greatest worry. He's not like, oh yeah, Sam's just gonna see too many people get saved. Not why Violet won't be an activated evangelist. Like, that's not God's biggest fear. You know, I don't know if God has any fears, but I know that's not one of them. Like, like, man, competition will hinder our celebration in our midst, right? Like, let's agree to just get rid of comparison. Let's get rid of criticism. Let's get rid of callousness and competition that we might step forth into the kingdom celebration that wants to release us into who God has called us to be. Amen? So let's stand up. And if the band wants to come back up, Praise God. Yes, that's good. That's good. And we're going we're gonna to respond in some worship. But before we respond in some worship, we're just going to pray. Say pray. pray. Man, repetition is such a like, strategic thing for drinking water. Take notes. <laughs> just take notes. We're just going to pray. And we're going to move into a time of response. And I want like, to go after these inhibitors. Just like think about these inhibitors as like, man, people that are just wanting to steal your joy. Like if celebration is a joyful thing, if it is a good thing, like we have so clearly talked about already, then these inhibitors are, are they're like wanting to rob you of joy. Like picture in your mind for a second, close your eyes. You're walking around London and some dude comes up to you with a knife. He's like, give me your wallet. Give me your watch. You know, like, that's what these inhibitors are wanting to do to you. They're wanting to steal your joy. And that same sort of, I don't know, aggravation, you, don't, you guys don't have to keep your eyes closed now, you can open them. <laughs> but that, that same sort of annoyance or that aggression that you would have towards this person who's wanting to steal your physical possessions. Like, I want us to go after the enemy with this sort of aggression, all right? The kingdom of God suffers much violence and the violent will take it by force. Like, God wants there to be freedom tonight. And are we willing to step into it? All right, so we're going to go after these things with the authority that Jesus has given us to establish his kingdom in our midst. Amen? Amen. So if you need to, like, posture yourself in some sort of attack mode, just go for it. You know, if that's standing on a chair, if that's, like, getting down on your knees, if that's, like, locking arms with your bro, your roommate, like, yeah, that's good, Joseph, up on the chair. That's a pioneer. We love it. Like, we are going to deal aggressively with God. We're going to take a moment. God, reveal to us which one of these inhibitors is coming against us, if not all four. Lord, reveal to us right now in Jesus' name that we might deal aggressively with them and see the kingdom of God and all of its joy and celebration established in our midst in Jesus' name. All right. I want us all to repeat after me. King Jesus, we love you. And we want to be more like you. We want to see your celebration released. We want to see joy released. We want to see thanksgiving released. We want to see freedom released. 
We're tired of the enemy having a stronghold in our lives. We're tired of allowing the enemy to steal our joy. There's a lot of words. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> Say, Jesus. Jesus. We repent, we repent. Of, anything of anything hindering our celebration. We recognize comparison, we recognize comparison. As, a as a thief of joy. We recognize criticism we recognize as something that will suck our life. Suck our life. We recognize callousness. As something that is making my heart hard. We recognize competition as something which has no place amongst the people of God. We repent of these things. We turn away from them. We change our minds about them. We will choose celebration. According to God's word, according to God's purposes, in Jesus' name, we receive your forgiveness. Wherever we've fallen short, empower us, Jesus, to walk like you and live like you. In Jesus' name, and we choose from this moment on rebuke the devil and to walk in the opposite spirit choosing to celebrate what you're doing in my life and others Jesus name Amen guys let's lift up a big shout of freedom and celebration